The floor is yours. Okay, so this talk will be assuming the genotypes are already in your hands from high coverage sequence data from SNP array data. You have good quality genotypes and then taking them to the step of phasing. My declarations. So usually the data we get does not have haplotypes. Haplotypes are sequences of alleles that have been inherited from a single parent, but we don't usually see the haplotypes in the data that we receive. Off the machines, we get unfazed genotypes, which are just the pair of alleles that are at each non-sex chromosome. So here, the line represents a segment of a chromosome. We have four genotypes showing at four sites. What haplotype phasing tries to do is reconstruct what the actual sets of alleles or sequences of alleles that were inherited from each parent. So below, we have two other lines that each of these now represents a haplotype or a set of alleles that were transmitted from a parent, and this is one possible reconstruction of these haplotypes. If you look at each uh, pair, at each marker, the two alleles that you see on the two haplotypes match the unfazed genotype, so we haven't lost any information. And what we've gained is, is an understanding of how they're actually transmitted from the parent. Haplotype phasing is all about unfazed, or uh, all about heterozygous genotypes. So when you do have a homozygous genotype, like in the third marker, we have a TT homozygous, there's nothing really to do. We know both, both haplotypes have to carry this T allele. Where all the work is, is determining how to assign the heterozygote genotypes where the alleles differ. So the simplest case is just phasing two heterozygote genotypes. So for simplicity, just call the alleles A and B. A, for example, could be the major allele, B, the minor allele at each marker, and you just have two choices, right? The A's are on the same haplotype, that's in the left side. The A's are on the different haplotypes. That's on the right side. That's it. Just two choices. Very, very straightforward. What happens when you add a third heterozygote? Well, now, when you look at the last two heterozygotes, there are again two choices. The upper branch has the A's on the same haplotype for the last two heterozygotes. The lower branch has the A's on different haplotypes. The same happens on the right-hand side. The point of this slide is that every time you add a heterozygote, the number of possible phasing doubles. As you, when you add that heterozygote, there's two ways to continue uh, the haplotypes onto that new heterozygote. So that means you have exponential growth, and uh, means there's a lot of haplotypes. So by the time you get to 300 heterozygotes, which is in sequence data not a very big part of the genome, in humans that would be 500 KB, a very small slice, you're already up to over 10 to the 90 possible phasings of that data Do you have to sort through. The usual idiom in English we use when there's a huge search space and we're trying to find the solution is that we're searching for a needle in the haystack. But that idiom is actually very misleading. This is, the, this is the scale. Atom in the universe, right? 10 to the 90 is on the order of the number of atoms in the universe. And somewhere in that sky you see, there's an atom that represents the correct phasing. And your job is to find it. Phase that way, it seems like it's a fool's errand, that there's no way to do it. But there's enough structure in the human data because of the way genetic information is passed down and the correlations. You'll see that with, later in the talk with large sample sizes that we have a pretty good chance of finding that atom, at least on the, the scale of the 300 heterozygotes. So why are we interested in haplotypes? Well, it gets us closer to the biology. That's how genetic information is transmitted from the parents. You haven't lost any of the information that's in the genotypes. You can recover the genotypes. But in addition, you have the phase information, understanding how alleles were transmitted together. So as a result, haplotype methods tend to be more accurate. Whether you're talking about genotype imputation, which are very strongly haplotype-based methods, like Olivia was discussing earlier, or local ancestry inference, or detection of very short identity by descent segments, in all of these cases, haplotype methods are more powerful simply because they have more information. You're basing it on more information. The one exception, which usually is not the case, but I, I, full disclosure, you need to mention it, is if your haplotype accuracy isn't good enough for the analysis you're doing, that's the one case where haplotyping 
based methods could lose accuracy. If, you're, if what you're trying to do is find shared haplotypes that are 40 centimeter Morgans long, 40 megabases long, let's say, you may run into trouble using haplotype-based methods and just simply because that's a very long stretch of, of uh, the genome to have perfectly phased haplotypes. Although with really large sample sizes, that's, that can be possible too. So most of this talk will be on statistical phasing methods which use correlation, and we'll spend a good chunk of time in the next five minutes talking about those. But we'll also very quickly deal with a much simpler phasing method called Mendelian phasing, which uses the two parents and an offspring and a parent-offspring trio to phase the offspring. It just it uses Mendelian, uh, Mendelian inheritance rules and, and parental genotypes, and it's conceptually very straightforward, and it'll provide a way to assess the accuracy of statistical phasing. So statistical phasing methods are very, very highly developed. I mean, it's really amazing. These methods have kept up, for the most part, with the explosion in, genotype, in the size of data sets. And we all know, you know, there's been ex exponential growth in the scale of the data sets we have. And for the statistical phasing has largely kept up with that. So they're very highly developed, but if you boil them down to their essence, they're variations on this type of the structure shown on this slide. You start, you get your genotypes, and the first thing you do is, at every heterozygote genotype, you randomly flip a coin and assign one of the alleles to the first haplotype and one to the second. That's just to get rid of any biases in the ordering of the alleles in the input data. And then the real work begins. So you start by creating a haplotype probability model, which is just what the name says. Give it a haplotype, the model spits out an estimate of the probability of that haplotype, or in other words, an estimate of what the population frequency is. It doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. Right? These models are, are what we need to, to make traction on this problem. Once you have that model, you can now update everybody's haplotypes to be a little bit more accurate. We started with randomly ordering the heterozygotes so we're as inaccurate as it's possible to, to be. In some sense, this is the worst possible phasing, unless you're deliberately trying to create a bad phasing. But with this model, we can then find the pair of haplotypes that's consistent with the genotype data that has the highest probability. And we get the probability of a pair of haplotypes is just same calculation as for alleles. It's two times the probability of each haplotype. We update everybody's haplotypes. So now our haplotypes are a little bit more accurate. And we then start a loop where we keep repeating steps two and three. At each step, something gets better. So now that we have a little bit better haplotypes, we go back to step two. And because our haplotypes are a little bit more accurate, our haplotype frequency model is giving estimates of frequency that are a little closer to the truth. It's a little bit better. We have a better haplotype frequency model after step two, we go to step three. And now when we sample haplotypes and find, or not sample, but find that pair of haplotypes is closest, uh, that has the highest frequency consistent with the data, they will be a little bit more accurate. And it's a virtuous cycle. At each step, something gets better. And after typically around 20 iterations, thereabouts, your haplotypes, the haplotypes are not changing that much in each iteration. You stop and say, okay, these are my final haplotypes. Now, there's various huge numbers of optimizations on this. Uh, for example, when you update the haplotypes for each individual, rather than choosing the pair with the highest probability, you might do something that's close to that using a greedy algorithm or doing some sampling conditional on the model or something like that. But, but this is the basic structure. Now, in step two, where you create this haplotype probability model, so far we've talked about it as a black box. You give it a haplotype, it spits out a, a, a probability. I want to give a little intuition on how that works. So this is, uh, we're going to look at some intuition behind what's called the Lee and Stevens model, named after Non Lee, Na Lee and Matthew Stevens, who, who developed it originally. The haplotype at the top is the haplotype we want to find the probability of, or get an estimate of the probability of it. The variant sites have color-coded fonts with the DNA base. The dots just represent sites that aren't, there's no variation. And the intuition here is that individuals share segments of, of uh, share haplotypes identical by descent. You go back to the common ancestor, and at each point of the, in, at the genome, you find their common ancestor, and somewhere around that point, those two individuals will share a segment of DNA. So we try to express the haplotype 
as a sequence of segments of reference haplotypes. The idea is that the target haplotype has inherited, uh, uh, has inherited a sequence of a reference haplotype from some ancestor. And we can express those segments just using a path. So the path just has horizontal and vertical edges. The horizontal edges just denote one segment of a reference haplotype. The vertical just, when it goes vertical, it just indicates we're switching to a new reference haplotype to start a new segment. So this, this path would represent two uh, reference haplotype segments. And for each path, we're, right now we'll just consider one path, this one. For each path, we want to understand what's the probability that this haplotype that we're trying to find the, the, the probability of could have arisen as inherited copies of these segments. And well, if it's inherited copies, we expect the alleles to match. So in this case, this haplotype, the haplotype we're trying to find the probability of has a very low probability of arising from these two segments. Very, two, very low probability of being in, coming from inherited copies of these two set reference haplotype segments because there's mismatches all over the place. Right? Only the middle allele matches, the other four do not match. So you might think, well, I'll be clever. I'll just choose a path where we're just skipping around and we'll make sure that we always match the alleles. Right? Well, then we run into the second thing, the second criteria, which is that there's a model for how long we expect these haplotype segments to be. We, under, we have a model for the distribution of segment lengths. And if you have a lot of short segments like this, that has very low probability. And so in this case, even though we have allele mismatching, the allele matches at every marker, the, uh, it's, it would still have a low probability of the target haplotype arising from, a, from this sequence of reference segments denoted by the path, just simply because the segments are all so short. About the best we could do would be a path like this, where uh, we have two segments and everything matches. We can't find a single segment that matches everywhere with these reference haplotypes in this toy example, but I can find two segments, and these would be as long as possible. This would have a higher probability that the target haplotype would have a higher probability of arising as inherited copies of these segments. So we've looked at three segments. There's obviously lots, lots more segments. We'll stop there. You, you sum up the probabilities you get for every possible segment, for every possible uh, path or the segments that come from the path, you look at what's the probability that the target haplotype could be inherited copies of those segments. You sum it all up and you get a probability of the haplotype. And there are very clever algorithms, very clever optimizations, shortcuts, all sorts of tricks to be able to do this calculation and you, you don't actually sum over all the possible paths or all the possible sets of sequences of reference haplotypes. There's ways to, do, to sort of aggregate things and and make, be able to do this calculation even for tens or hundreds of thousands of individuals. Okay, so that's statistical phasing. Now, fairly, a fairly complex topic. The next one is sort of a breath of fresh air. It's, it's so much more intuitive. Mendelian phasing. So we have an offspring heterozygote that we want to phase. All we have to do is look and see if a parent is homozygous. So here, the the top uh, layer of figures is the two, are the two parents. The square represents the father. The father is homozygous for the A allele, so there's only one allele the father can transmit. So you can immediately infer, well, the A is from the father's haplotype, the B must be from the mother's haplotype. That's all there is to Mendelian phasing. We're ignoring uh, the, the idea of a de novo mutation here just because in this, in this particular context, we don't need to worry about it. The de novo mutation rate is so low on the order of 10 to the minus eight per meiosis that it's just changing things in the fourth, fifth, sixth significant digit. It's, it's not affecting things. We can, for simplicity, fortunately, we can ignore it. So if we want to assess the accuracy of statistical phasing, we need some kind of measure. And the most common measure, and intuitively sort of the easiest to get our heads around, is something called the switch error rate. So we take the pairs of consecutive heterozygotes and look at going from one heterozygote to the next, how often do we get the phasing wrong? And the proportion of times we get it wrong, that's the switch error rate. So going back to that figure we showed earlier, if we know the truth, we'll know which of these two options for two heterozygotes is correct, and we just simply look and see, does the statistical, statistical phasing also get it correct, or does it get it wrong? And the proportion of times 
going from one header's eye get to the next, he gets it wrong, that's the switch error rate. So if we have some trios in our data, the most common way of estimating the, the accuracy of statistical phasing is to use those trio offspring and estimate the accuracy in the trio offspring. So you assume the Mendelian phase is the true phase, and then you exclude the parents from the statistical phasing so that you're not using that information. And you, you phase the, the data set that includes the offspring, and in the offspring then you compare the phasing with the phasing you got from the parents using the Mendelian phasing. And you estimate the switch error rate. So one point that's important to realize is that we aren't estimating the phasing accuracy in trio offspring when the parents are included. So what we're estimating is, because the statistical phasing is excluding the the parents. We would have much lower, better phase accuracy in the true offspring if we had the parents in there. But without the parents, we're essentially estimating the phase accuracy in individuals who don't have their parents in the data set. So just be aware that even though we're using trios, we're really getting an estimate in, P in individuals who do not have parents in the data set because we're excluding the parents from the statistical phasing. We're not using that information. Okay. So. If you've looked at the data, and various groups have at various times, you'll notice that there's two primary error modes for, for statistical phasing. So to make things visually easier to follow, we've color-coded the two haplotypes. The red boxes are alleles inherited from one parent. The blue is alleles inherited for the other parent. We're only showing heterozygous genotypes. And the first type of error is what I call a single switch error. It's, an, it's a switch error that's not preceded or followed by a switch error. So here in this, on the right, you can see that there's one switch error in your data because they fairly easy to see with the color coding. Between heterozygote three and four, that's the one place where the red alleles aren't on the same haplotype. Or to put it another way, the blue alleles aren't on the same haplotype. Everywhere else, the phasing is correct. So what would the switch error rate be? Just mentally, just see if you can compute it. Right, switch error is the, is the proportion of consecutive heterozygotes that are incorrectly phased. We have eight heterozygotes. That means seven pairs of consecutive heterozygotes, one of which is incorrectly phased. Switch error rate would be one seventh. Now the other kind of switch error is a double switch error. It's where you have, this is the second error mode, where you have two switch errors back to back. And it turns out that double switch errors in really well phased data, with, in other words, data with very large sample sizes, that's actually the dominant error mode. If you go to the UK Biobank, the proportion of the observed switch errors that are part of double switch errors is 80% in the white British. Uh, and I think that's probably true in the whole data set too, but it, it's definitely true in the white British. In, the se in some sequence data, we have, we'll look at some sequence data for 40,000 samples, and over 90% of the switch errors are part of double switch errors. That is the dominant error mode. And the first time you see this, that's a little odd, and you think, why would they be clustering like this? Why would you have switch errors back to back? But the color coding, I think, guides us the way, to an explanation for this phenomena. So if you look at the double switch errors with the color coding, you can see that everything is phased correctly except one outlier, one, one marker is messed up. Everything else is correct. So double switch errors arise when you have a a heterozygote that is what I call unfazable. Unfazable just means there's no information statistical phasing can use to phase it. So the classic example of this would be a singleton allele. Take a, a marker in your data where there's only one copy of one allele. That means the individual who carries that one copy has to be heterozygote. There's only one copy. The individual can't be homozygote for the allele. There's only one copy. So when you go to phase that individual, with statistical phasing, there's no information in the rest of the data set to phase it. Nobody else carries the allele. So statistical phasing will act really confident and spit out a phasing for it, but really it's guessing, right? It's just flipping a coin and it's assigning the allele to the haplotype or using some rule, but there's no information behind it. So what's gonna happen? Well, half the time, the statistical phasing will look like a genius and assign it to the right haplotype. And the other half the time, it'll look like a fool and, and get it wrong. Right? When it gets it wrong, you're going to have a double switch error. Right? So it's not just singleton alleles where this can happen. It's part of a more broad, broader phenomenon. Anytime you have a process like recurrent mutation or gene conversion that takes an allele and introduces it, puts it on a 
a different haplotypic background, and only one individual in your sample has that haplotypic background with the new allele, that also creates unfazable variants where there's no information for phasing. So it's singleton's the easiest to get your head around, but it's a part of a broader phenomenon. So turning to real data. So th this is SNP array data for the UK Biobank, and we're gonna focus on the white British trios because that's the subset that has the most accurate phasing. It's 80%, over 400,000 individuals in the, in the UK Biobank are classified as white British based on self-report and principal component analysis by the UK Biobank. And we're gonna look at the white British trios. If you looked at individuals who are not white British because they have a smaller sample size, the phasing accuracy is worse. It might, you know, it's a little over twice, the error rate's a little over twice as high. But we're focusing on the, the predominant group of the UK, uh, in the UK Biobank, the white British trios, although we're phasing the whole UK Biobank. We'll also look at top med. So this is a, a series of many different studies that were all sequenced as if they were the same study. So we downloaded, we got permission to access data from 11 of these studies that are among the larger studies and with uh, appropriate consents for what we wanted to do. And we combine the data together to get 38,387 samples. And two of these 11 studies have trios. You have the Barbados Asthma Genetic Study, which I'll refer to as the Barbados Study, and the Framingham Heart Study, which I'll refer to as the Framingham Study. Now we'll find when we look at results that the accuracy, the switch error rate in the top med data is not as good as the UK Biobank. And there's two reasons for that. The major reason is just simply sample size, right? The UK Biobank has 485,000, of which 400,000 are white British, whereas the top med, we only have 38,000, and the individual Barbados and Framingham studies are smaller yet. Barbados has around 1,000 samples. Framingham has a little over 4,000 samples. So these are much, much smaller studies. So that's the main reason the accuracy is gonna be less in sequence data. The other reason is Fritz sequence data has a lot more low frequency variants. And so uh, those are more, less informative and harder to phase. Here's the accuracy results. So the X axis has increasing sample sizes and it's on a log scale. So how these plots were developed is we started with the trio offspring for each, each data set. So we start with the UK British uh, Biobank trio offspring. And then we randomly order the rest of the samples in the data set and start adding additional samples to get increasing data set sizes. So we have 5,000, 15,000, and so on. So each data set size includes the same set of trio offspring. Okay, so we can look at the accuracy in that same set of trio offspring for each data set size. And what we see in all three plots is when we look at the y-axis, which is the switch error rate, is phasing accuracy increases with sample size. That's so important. It's with data that often we can, we can augment our data with other data that's out there. If you want to get good phase, phase accuracy, larger samples is better. For the UK Biobank, the general rule, just a rule of thumb, is every time we triple the sample size, the error rate drops by half. Right, so you can drive that error rate down as you see from the plot. In the, sequ in the sequence data in the middle and right hand plot, we also see improving error rates with sample size. The, air the improvement isn't as fast as with the UK Biobank and I think the reason for this, and I'll, I expect to be able to investigate this and confirm or refute this later in the year, but I think the reason for this is, is that the top of my data is much more heterogeneous. So with the UK Biobank, when we add additional samples, 80% of them are white British. So they're very relatively closely related to the, the white British trio offspring that we're measuring, measuring the phase accuracy in. With the top med data, as you add additional samples, you know, maybe only 2% are African Caribbean from the Barbados study. So a much lower proportion are very closely genetically related to the individuals that you're measuring phase accuracy in. So I think that's the reason we're not seeing the phase, the, accu the accuracy is improving, but not as quickly as in the UK Biobank data. So the, you can see that the dynamic range for the UK Biobank, even with 5,000, which is a relatively small section of the UK Biobank, you know, the phase accuracy is getting around 1%. So going from one heterozygote to the next, you have a 99% probability of phasing it correctly, essentially. 
Let me back up. So one thing that's bothered me for the last few years, and I haven't until recently been able to find a satisfactory way to address it, is that we always use the Mendelian phasing as the truth. Nobody questions the Mendelian phasing. Well, almost nobody. I mean, there are, occasionally you'll see hints of it in the, in the literature, but, but it's not, nobody raises it very often that I've seen. But there can be errors. So look at the trio on the left. We have an offspring that we want to phase, but in this case, Mendelian phasing can't phase it because we need a homozygous parent to phase the offspring, but neither parent's homozygous here. And the father of the square icon transmits the A allele. So normally, Mendelian phasing would just leave this child unfazed. No problem. But what if the, there's a allelic dropout? The A allele isn't there, and the father's called as BB. Well, now Mendelian phasing looks at it and says, I can phase this. The father transmits a B. The mother transmits an A. But what's, what, what's the truth on the left? The right says the father transmits a, a B allele based on Mendelian phasing, but we know from the left, the truth is the father transmits an A. Mendelian phasing is exactly wrong. Now, genotype error rates are relatively low. Phasing error rates are relatively low. What's most likely to happen here is that in the region, this is the only Mendelian phase error. Everything else, Men Mendelian phasing is accurate on. That's the most likely uh, well, that's what is most likely to happen. Also, what's most likely to happen in the region is that the statistical phasing is correct. But when you go to evaluate phase accuracy, you're gonna, it's going to look like there's a double switch error. Right? You're going to see that if you're taking, assuming the Mendelian phasing is the phasing on the far left, the true phasing, the, the phasing that the statistical phasing comes out will be the one on the right. So the statistical phasing gets the blame, but really the fault is in the Mendelian phasing. The Mendelian phasing phasing's wrong, but the errors get ascribed to the statistical phasing here because we're assuming Mendelian phasing is the truth, even when it's not. So that's the first type of error. The second type of error that, you can occur, that can occur is an error in the offspring. So here, you have a homozygous offspring. Normally, you get the phasing here for free, both, you know, both parents have transmitted the A allele. But if there's a genotype error in the offspring, and let's say it's miscalled as AB, because of the parent genotypes, Mendelian phasing will, will phase it and says, okay, the A came from the father and the B allele came from the mother. But of course, the B allele here is an artifact. It's the, the true genotype in the offspring is AA, but the, but the B allele doesn't really exist. When statistical phasing goes to phase the offspring, it's we, you know, when we're estimating phase accuracy, we exclude the parents from statistical phasing, so we don't see the data there. There's no information to figure out where this allele that doesn't exist goes. I mean, the allele doesn't exist. How do you figure out what haplotype it goes on? Well, again, half the time you'll guess right. The statistical phasing algorithm has to guess. Half the time you'll guess right. Half the time you'll guess wrong. And when you guess wrong, it will most likely show up as a double switch error. But it's not really, it's, it's a genotype error. It's creating an artificial or a, a spurious heterozygote. So here's the same data we showed before. And we developed a method for estimating genotype error rates from, from TRIO data. And once we had a handle on what those genotype error rates were, we could estimate the, the number of errors we expect to see that are Mendelian phase errors. We, we can estimate the number of spurious heterozygotes in the offspring and then correct the statistical phasing. And so that's what we show in the green dots below. There's actually confidence intervals here, but I guess they're, they do show up on the screen, but they're very narrow and hard to see. It's confidence intervals based on a bootstrap sampling, but the, the estimation seems to be very precise. We're not seeing a lot of variation in our confidence intervals. They're, they're very narrow. And you can see that the estimated true rate just shifts the graph down. So for 5,000 samples, the difference between the estimated true rate and the observed switch error rate, it, there's inflation, but it's not enough to really ruin your day, right? You know, the observed rate might be 10% more than we estimate the true rate to be. But as you start driving that error rate down by increasing the sample size, more and more of the phase errors you see 
you know, a higher and higher proportion of them turn out to be artifacts. So by the time you get up to the 485,000 size, most of the, the differences you see between the statistical phasing and the Mendelian phasing are actually artifacts, either uh, errors in the Mendelian phasing or heterozygotes that aren't really heterozygotes, they're spurious heterozygotes. So the observed switch error rate is actually almost two and a half times as large as what we estimate the true switch error rate to be in these white British trios. The same principle holds for, uh, the same pattern holds with the African Caribbean and the European Americans. We can see that, you know, the switch error rate declines in a higher and higher proportion of the switch errors are artifacts, but the sample size in this, in this analysis hasn't reached the point yet where it's really distorting the results. It's just a little bit of a distortion. But you can see from the trends that if we, you know, go up to 150,000 or 300,000 individuals, it'll be a different story and it will also reach the point where most of the switch errors we see will in fact be artifacts. So one more, I'll have one more data slide. And before doing that, I wanna revisit single and double switch errors. When you compute a switch error rate, single switches are counted as one switch error, double switches, they get counted as two. But double switches I think are best understood as one allele, one, you know, one heterozygote that there's no information to phase, and so had to, we had to guess what the phasing is. So another way to think about this is you could count double switch errors as just one switch error, not two. So let's call a phase error either a single switch error or a double switch error, and then you can also correct, use the methods we just talked about to correct the uh, error rate, correct the switch error rate for errors in the genotype data. And this is what we estimate for the distance between switch errors, or between phase errors, where phase error is either single or double switch. So we estimate the mean megabases between phase errors in the white British subset of the UK Bob Bank is on the order of 64 megabases. That is a huge distance. It's longer than chromosome 19. That's a huge distance between errors. We estimate the number of phase errors per autosome, or you know, over the autosome per individual, is around 43, less than two per chromosome. Again, that's very, very accurate. To put it into perspective, we estimate the number of sp spurious Mendelian phase heter heterozygotes is around 45. So with this particular sample size, the phasing error rates have been driven down low enough so that when you see a heterozygote, the odds that that heterozygote has been misphased is on the same, approximately equal to the odds that that heterozygous genotype has been miscalled. That it's actually a homozygous genotype that is miscalled as a heterozygote. The phasing accuracy has actually reached the level with this sample size in this population where it's actually matching the genotype error rate. You can have as much confidence in the phasing in a sense as you do in the genotypes. And there's no reason, you know, once you correct for the genotype errors, with larger sample sizes, we can't even get to a point where we actually have more confidence in the phasing than in the genotypes. In other words, if you have a heterozygote, your big worry is whether it's been miscalled, not whether it's been misphased, is, is what I expect as we get into larger data sets. Results for the African Caribbean data and the European American data, which are sequence data, they sort of pale in comparison to the UK Biobank, but they're still very, very respectable. We're estimating going a megabase between phase errors, in other words, you're going on average five, 600 or more heterozygotes between phase errors on average, so that's still very good phasing. It's just with these smaller sample sizes, it's not at the level of the UK white, white British in ac terms of accuracy. So just to, to um, summarize the, the main points. So with statistical phasing, ac accuracy increases with sample size, that is, the huge determinant. So if you can, if you have a small sample size and can find other sequence data or something that you can combine with it, you know, if you, if you're, if you have SNP array data and you can combine it with sequence data and throw away the other variants if you want, but you, you will improve the accuracy. Second, in really large sample sizes with um, tens of thousands of individuals for sequence data or hundreds of thousands of individuals for SNP array data, most of the observed switch errors are actually double switch errors, which indicate one allele was unable to be phased or was phased incorrectly in the, in the Mendelian phasing. 
Uh, third, and this hasn't gotten a lot of in attention in the literature, but it's good to be aware of, especially for large sample sizes, genotype error inflates the observed switch error rates when you're using trios to measure them. And it's, it's an annoyance for small sa smaller sample sizes, but it's a, it's a big problem for large sample sizes. And then this is very recent results. It's the for correcting switch error rate to account for these gene type errors, it's possible to estimate the true situ switch error rate and account for that. And this is very recent work, just published a couple of weeks ago in the American Journal of Human Genetics. So just some acknowledgments from our lab and funders and data sources. And, and if, anyone if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. A uh, question for Brian. Again, I mean, please state your name when you, you come to the mic. In, in the meantime, I, I, have, I have one. And so you, you ended to say that the double switcher were all wrong. At the end, did you find, could you confirm some? And what are the rules about those you know, double, double switch. Is there a minimal distance between, between the two positions where there is a, a recombination? Uh, almost all of your switch errors are part of either a single or just two switch errors back to back. You can occasionally find three or more switch errors back to back, but that's relatively rare. Uh, of the ones when you are looking with trios and you do see double switch errors, some of them will be unfeasible heterozygotes, some of them will be errors in the Mendelian phasing for the trios. Some of them will be due to spurious heterozygotes, you know, and we can, using these methods, sort of estimate, you know, what proportion of the switch errors go in each bin. For any individual switch error, we can't say, oh, this is, belongs in that category because we don't, we don't have the, tr the truth, right? We're using the Mendelian phasing as the truth, but the problem is it's not necessarily the truth. We don't have any truth for the truth, right? So. Any individual gene type, we can't necessarily answer that question, but we can estimate the proportions of, of double switch errors and what's causing them. Yeah, imputation is, is the most, uh, down, most common downstream analysis. So the, so the question is, what uh, errors in phasing, what's the consequence for imputation? Uh, well, there, it, my impression, and Olivier can, you would be good to talk with him too, he he's probably has his even more experience with the data, but my impression is that uh, imputation is remarkably robust to phase errors, at least at the level of phase errors that we typically achieve. So yes, it's gonna, it will lower your imputation accuracy, particularly um, I think with lower frequency variance is what I, my intuition would be. But I've been surprised, I, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised that uh, imputation accuracy seems to do quite well, even, even w and tolerate some, some reasonable amount of phasing error. That's my impression and Olivier, you might wanna ask him and see his impression too, but that's, that's what, I've, what I think I've seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're working now on a method for estimating local ancestry inference in admixed individuals. Uh, I've done a lot of work on, with, with Sharon, my collaborator, main collaborator, on est detecting identity by descent segments and then using applications. So this is two generations down in applications. You use phase data to estimate IVD segments, identity by descent segments, which are segments shared by individuals. And then you use those segments then to do population demographic inference or to estimate mutation rate or to estimate, um, uh, well, po effective population size in the back. So there's a lot of applications then for the IB identity by descent segment. So, so yeah, I've actually, we were involved in quite a few applications. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah.
So I want to check what your thoughts are about uh, the trade-off between sample size and macro overlap in such scenarios for Jason. Yeah, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you have access to two, two biobanks, and there's, you're saying very little overlap between the markers or very high overlap? Very little. Very little. That's, uh, if there's very little overlap, it's going to be tough to augment your sample in that way. Sort of the, the easiest solution is if you have some large sequence data set, because then you can just throw out markers as necessary to match whatever array you're doing, you're dealing with. So it's easiest to augment your data with sequence data if it's available. I didn't catch the first part of the question. Could you repeat that? Um, sorry. So I might be misunderstanding that. Is the true rate of um, double phasing in nature known? And if so, do you incorporate that information into your statistical phasing? All right. Well, you've anticipated something I'm going to look, look into. Uh, currently, no, I do not. And that's something I intend to do model the fact that d double switch errors seem to be the predominant error mode in large scale data. And it seems like that could be modeled. Uh, it, it won't necessarily improve the switch error rate by modeling it, I suspect, but, w or it might, but I don't expect it will do that. But I think having double switch errors is actually preferable to having single switch errors in my view. Double switch errors are easier to model in downstream analysis than single switch errors. And I could give examples of that if you want to ask off, offline. But um, so currently, no, I'm not modeling double switch errors, but, but it, that could be done in something I intend to look into when I have the, the time and capacity to do that. Okay, so I haven't worked much in the area of, of association testing. I've done a little bit of work in that a long time ago. So most of the, the most common application for phasing and association testing is in imputation or something like that. I've, it is possible to do some haplotypic association testing, although that hasn't, you know, that hasn't been why hasn't been a lot of work in that area in the last 20 years. Just because I think the single marker testing has been very eff effective. Uh, then, what was your second question again? I'm sorry. Your thoughts about using long reads. Uh, okay. In so, in incorporating that information, Olivia has done some work. At, some is done the most work in that area of, of anyone. Uh, we should be able to incorporate it uh, computationally. My impression is it's challenging uh, because it's, you know, if you're working directly with the reads, that's a lot of information. Uh, and ideally, we should be using that information. Uh, but currently, it's generally not, it's in practice, it's not often used. But that may change. I expect it will change over time. I mean, eventually, when, you know, down the road, I'm sure Oxford Nanopore would like to hand us phase resolved genomes and and statistical phasing won't necessarily be used for phasing. It will still have some other applications, but it won't necessarily be used for phasing at that point, but that's down the road. Thank you, Brian. So uh, I want to, uh, to thank you for uh, coming to today. Um, enjoy the next four days of science. Bon appétit, and join again me in thanking both uh, Olivier and Brian for the talk today.